Comet down the line. Okay. This is the ambulance. How can I help you? Hey, can I get an ambulance? And uh, please, the 1200 North Nimitz Highway, Xerox Corp. What's wrong? Somebody, somebody's got a gun. Has been shooting people up in the building. Okay, the, inside the building. Yeah, inside the building. Okay. And on. you need the cops for you now. Okay. You're calling from Hyde Street. Yeah, I'm calling from an office on the side someplace. Okay, 1200 North Limit. Right. Okay. Okay, hang on now. Okay. Yeah. Holy. Okay, you don't know how many people were shot. Then? No. Police help, Police. This is Andy. Um, sir, sir. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Sir, what's going on? It's one of the guys came into our Xerox building with a gun. What's the address? To shoot people. What is the address? 1200 non limits Highway, Xerox Corp. You got to get there right away. Okay, anybody hurt? Yeah. Uh, some of the guys said some guys are down. They're dead. In the morning hours of November 2nd, 1999, shots rang out in the Xerox office in Honolulu, Hawaii. A disturbed and disgruntled employee was calmly executing his sinister plan as other employees scrambled to escape. This employee was Byron Yuyasuji. Often cited as the worst mass shooting in Hawaii's history, the Xerox shootings that resulted in the death of seven people on an early morning in November of 1999 would shatter the often calm and peaceful atmosphere of Honolulu. To even begin to understand the twisted mind of Byron, we have to start at the beginning. Not too much is known about Byron Yuyasuji's past, not even his full birth date. Most places just state the year of his birth, 1959. An archive news paper from Honolulu states he was born on October 11, 1959 in Honolulu to his father Hiroyuki Yuyasuji and mother Bonnie Yuyasuji. Byron was said to be relatively normal growing up and progressed through school while being part of the school's rifle team in high school, as well as a member of the JROTC or Junior Reserve Officers Training Corps. This is a military regulated high school program that educates students in leadership and aims to motivate young people to become better citizens. Byron would graduate from Roosevelt High School in 1977. Throughout researching and reading about the case and piecing facts together, there seems to be three key events that could have contributed to Byron's downward spiral. The first would be when Byron crashed his father's car while he was on his way home from a high school graduation party. In the accident, Byron's head violently collided with the windshield of the car. According to his brother, after this incident, he was never the same person. Byron's father contradicted this statement and claims that the turning point was in 1984 when Byron began working for Zero as a repairman. That's event number two. The third event happened in 1988 when Byron's mother passed away. Shortly after, Byron started complaining about a poking sensation in his head. Despite changes in his behavior, his neighbors and acquaintances described him as a relatively normal, nice guy who seemed to live an everyday life and had hobbies just like any normal person. Byron's hobbies included gun collecting, raising koi and thousands of goldfish, along with woodworking. He was said to be a perfectionist in all of his self-taught hobbies and knowledgeable in his job. At some point, presumably after his mother died in 1988, Byron's now elderly father came to live with him. At his job at Xerox, Byron would be transferred to another work group, where trouble would immediately begin. Byron started accusing members of his new group of sabotaging his work. When a machine would stop working shortly after he made repairs, he would storm back to his group and accuse them of tampering with the machines to make him look bad, as well as make accusations of harassment against them. These harassment allegations and tampering were said to be unfounded after an investigation of his complaints. His work group would try calming him down once he went into one of these angry rants but were not very effective at doing so. Previous co-workers of Yuyasuji said that this caused his current group to isolate themselves away from him. This would only make Byron more upset and ramp up his beliefs that he was being backstabbed and sabotaged as now they are making meetings without him as well as trying to actively avoid him. This anger eventually culminated in Byron making death threats toward them while cursing them out. In 1993, during one of these anger and Induced outbursts, Byron began kicking an elevator door in the office out of pure rage, causing the police to be called on him. As a result, he was arrested for third-degree criminal property damage. After being released, Xerox ordered him to undergo psychiatric evaluation alongside anger management courses. During the psychiatric evaluation, Byron claimed he heard voices in his head at times and claimed to have a black shadow following him around frequently. When he was asked to draw a person, he drew a devil with a pitchfork instead. When asked by the doctor what the devil was doing, he responded, 
responded with smiling and watching all the bad people do bad things. As a follow-up, he was asked what the devil was thinking. Byron responded with, it's just like your conscience. Do it. Get even with that suck up. He did you wrong. Get him. During the subsequent tests, he also claimed there was a conspiracy against him and that his home was bugged with listening devices. Upon the conclusion of the psych evaluations, Byron was found to be suffering from delusional disorder and paranoia. Despite this, he was found to not be dangerous and was allowed back to work. The same year of these evaluations, Byron would confide in his brother Dennis some troubling information. Byron claimed that he was pinned down by a shadow person in his bed and still complained of that poking sensation inside of his head two to three times per week for years at this point. The poking sensations had also moved to other parts of his body and were becoming more troublesome. One day while Dennis was over at his house, Byron pointed out a fish and stated that something had broken its back and eventually accused his co-worker Jason of injuring the fish. He also thought Jason was the ringleader of the conspiracy against him at work. On another day, Byron called into work as the poking sensations progressed. Dennis came over and found Byron pummeling himself in the head with his fists. Both Dennis and his father suggested that Byron go see a doctor, to which Byron refused. In 1995, while at work, during another one of Byron's paranoid outbursts, he threatened to shoot up the entire building if he was ever fired. This statement about being fired can be attributed to Byron's paranoia of the Xerox copier that he specialized in being phased out, and as a result, the company would no longer have need for him. This, however, was Byron's own fault as he absolutely refused to do any training on the more modernized machines coming in despite the company and his co-workers urging him to take the company supplied training. Thinking the new machines would be too much for him and fearing failure, he only wanted to work on the older Xerox model that he already knew. He had put off training for years to the point that there was only one model left in the entire company that he was still trained to work on. All others had been phased out. To him, this last machine was his lifeline in the company, and anybody who tampered with it would pay the ultimate price. Byron's visual and auditory hallucinations continued along alongside his paranoia into the coming years, and in 1997, as a means to dispel the shadow figures, the family sought the help of a Shingon priest who came and blessed the entire house. The priest also set a protective barrier to ward off evil spirits. While there, even the priest suspected Byron of having a mental illness. Byron's father again suggested he go get help from a doctor for his hallucinations and poking sensations. Byron chose not to, saying, I don't think they can help me. Byron's childhood friend Brian Isara said these claims of a shadow figure were worsened by a streetlight outside of Yuyasuji's room casting a long shadow onto his bed. This was later confirmed by Byron's brother Dennis, who said Byron claimed seeing a shadow person outside of his window pass by the garage and go down the road at night. Leading up to the events of November 2nd, 1999, Xerox began heavily committing to phasing out the copier model that Yuyasuji knew how to service. His supervisors and co-workers were tired of working around his stubbornness, and on November 1st, he was pulled into his manager's office where he was told that the following day, November November 2nd, he was to report for mandatory training on the new machines. That evening after work, Byron went home and started tending to his fish located in the backyard. His neighbor recalls speaking with him and noting that he was polite, happy, and seemed normal. Byron awoke the next morning, cleaned his fish tanks, and spoke with his father. Byron's father remembers that Byron was not acting strangely or out of character. Byron then drove to the Xerox warehouse where he worked and calmly walked in at around 8 in the morning. Byron went to the second floor of the warehouse and pulled out a 9mm Glock 17. He then walked into the cramped corridor that held enclosed offices. He then stepped into one of the small offices, room 204, and shot Ronald Kawame who was sitting at his desk, killing him instantly. The supposed ringleader in the conspiracy against Byron, Jason Balatico, was in the office as well and was fatally shot as he tried to run away. There was a third man in the office, Randall Shin, but Byron chose not to shoot him and allowed him to leave unharmed. Byron then calmly walked down to the conference room toward the end of the cramped hallway where five employees had gathered for a meeting. Byron had received word that this meeting was about him. Whether it was or not is unconfirmed. Byron entered the cramped conference room and shot all five employees, which included his supervisor, killing them all. As he turned his attention away from the conference room, he took aim at an eighth victim outside of the conference room but missed as they fled from the building and escaped. Byron didn't pursue them but instead strategically took an exit out of a back door into the company parking lot where he got into a green work van and departed from the parking lot. The first 911 call came in at 8.08, just eight minutes after Byron entered the building. Subsequent calls came from offices in the surrounding area as well as other employees that managed to get to safety. An employee in the parking lot recalls seeing Byron slowly and calmly drive away in a green company van. Authorities quickly locked down the surrounding streets, evacuated another Xerox building that held more offices, and went to Byron's home in an attempt to locate him. 
he wasn't there. He was found by mid-morning sitting in the green company van near the Hawaii Nature Center in Makiki, right above downtown Honolulu. A jogger passing by had seen him sitting there and reported him. Authorities knew that he was still armed and dangerous. To make matters worse, an event with 35 small children was in progress at the nearby Nature Center. With this information, authorities opted to negotiate with him and ease him into custody rather than storm toward him in order to avoid a potential gunfight. They threw him a phone which Byron then got out of the van and collected. Honolulu police chose Officer Cheryl Sunia to do the negotiation. Hours long standoff after he went on his rampage on November 2nd, 1999. Cheryl Sunia was the first person who spoke to Uisugi after the shooting and she joins us now. You were the lead investigator in this case, uh, negotiator in the case. Uh, yes, yes. What, what did he tell you? He, he talked about um, his job. He talked about he was getting training on a new machine. They were setting him up to fail. It, it's, he had failure mm. in his tone all the time. Um, he felt people ridiculed him. People were picking on him. Um, I didn't know anything. Yeah. So I, didn't, I couldn't substantiate what he was telling me. Um, she spent the next five hours negotiating and states that Byron was contemplating suicide during these negotiations. During the negotiations, Byron could be seen brandishing his pistol, smoking, and reading magazines. After five hours of this, Brian Yuyasuji surrendered to police. Upon further searches of Byron's home, they seized 17 firearms, all registered to him with some being obtained as early as 1982. The trial of Byron Yuyasuji began on May 15, 2000. Byron was charged with one count of murder in the first degree, seven counts of murder in the second degree and one count attempted murder in the second degree. Byron pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity while claiming that he feared his co-workers were conspiring to get him fired as reasoning for his actions. After Byron attempted to use the insanity plea, he was examined by a Dr. Michael Wellner. During an interview with Wellner, Byron stated that if he refused the company training, he would be fired. I decided to give them a reason to fire me, he added. Michael Wellner would go on after the examinations to testify for the prosecution. On June 13, 2000, a little under one month later, the jury rejected the insanity defense and found Yu Yasuji guilty on count one for seven murders and count nine for the attempted murder. On August 8, 2000, Byron Yu Yasuji was sentenced to life in prison without possibility of parole for the seven murders. To be exact, the Hawaii Parole Board ordered Byron to serve a minimum of 235 years in prison. This is said to be the longest sentence ever for a Hawaii inmate. Seven men lost their lives as a result of the attacks. Ford was said to be a kind, fun-loving guy who adored his son. 800 friends, family, and co-workers came to his funeral to pay tribute to him. Ronald Kataoka was said to be a devoted father and husband and was said to be a great role model. His teachings seemed to have rubbed off on his daughter who went on after his death to excel in school, sports, and volunteering. Ronald Kawame was an employee of Xerox for 30 years. Ronald loved his job and was a golf enthusiast. Melvin Lee was a manager at Xerox who was said to have a big heart. He was soft-spoken and non-confrontational. Peter Mark had many people come forward during his funeral that said he was a loving, pleasant guy who loved the ocean. He cared about his children and looked forward to coming home from work every day to see them. His ashes were committed to the ocean at Monolua Bay Beach Park in Hawaii Kai. John Sakamoto was said to be a great family man to to his wife and two children. Neighbors also commented on how nice of a guy he was. Jason Balatico was said to have a great sense of humor. At his funeral, he was praised by many as a wonderful father and loving husband. That's about all I have for you guys. I will see you in the next case. If you enjoy this type of content, you know what to do to help out the channel. Thanks guys.